Hi guys, today we are going to start our unit on thermodynamics and today we are going to start talking about chapter 11. So this is going to be an introduction to the idea of temperature and kinetic theory and heat. Uh, some of you guys, this might be a review from what you learned in chemistry. Um, so depending, you, you may uh, remember a lot of what I'm about to uh, talk to you about, but if you don't, then this will serve as kind of a good uh, introduction conceptual review. So uh, the first thing we need to discuss is this idea of energy transformations because this is going to um, be essentially what we will be doing for the rest of the unit. So if you remember from AP1, energy is conserved. That means it can't be created or destroyed. It can only change from one form to another. So when we say that we're going to use energy, what we're saying is that we are actually going to transform it from its current state into another state. So some examples of energy transformation could be using the energy that's in food to power your body, um, to give you energy to go up the stairs, or a wind turbine that uses the kinetic energy of moving air um, to convert that into electrical energy, or even a battery. A battery has chemical inside of it and that chemical energy gets transferred into electrical energy so all of those are examples <coughs> um, an important thing to consider whenever we talk about energy is how efficient that energy transfer or how efficient that energy process is um, it's kind of a well it's a law in nature that nothing is a hundred percent efficient uh, you're always going to lose some amount of energy in the process and I know you guys uh, were I just told you that energy is not created or destroyed, so saying that the energy is lost might be a little bit confusing, but it's not that it's lost as in we don't know where it went, it's lost in that we cannot use it again. So a good example of this is kind of the process behind what makes a coal a power plant work. So here's just a little graphic that helps describe it. So when you burn coal, in a power plant you produce a certain amount of thermal energy and that thermal energy is what is powering this turbine to turn. This turbine and consequently uh, turns a generator and we talked about how generators work before, right? It's a wire that's turning within a magnetic field that will create electrical current. And so this turning turbine will turn the generator which in turn uh, generates electrical energy and that electrical energy goes out into the power lines and into your house. But through this process, uh, there is a lot of thermal energy that is lost to the environment. And we typically say that as being heat. Uh, we'll talk about heat a little in a few more slides. But this loss of thermal energy becomes really important because this is going to help us define how efficient this process is. So let's take a look um, mathematically at efficiency. So efficiency is just a ratio between what you get out of the system um, divided by what you had to pay or what you had to put into the system. So uh, this is typically denoted as a percentage, so you would take this fraction and then multiply it by 100. So the larger the energy loss that you have in a system, the lower its efficiency. Um, let me go back so we can do this example together. Um, so here we have two different light bulbs, just to show you guys. One is 15 watts and one is 75, but they each produce about 3 watts of visible light energy. So what is the efficiency of these light bulbs? So the first one, um, the fluorescent light bulb, what you are getting out of it is 3 watts. What you had to put into it, or what it is rated as, is 15. So that's an efficiency of about 0.2 or 20%. The other one is 3 watts over 75, and that's a much lower efficiency. That equates to about 4% of efficiency. So both bulbs produce the same visible light output, but the fluorescent bulb does so with a lower energy input, so it's more efficient. All right, so now we need to talk about, now that we've kind of discussed energy of a small amount, there is a section in your textbook that we're not going to get into, but it is kind of interesting. Um, it's 11.2, and it's about how your body uses energy. Uh, it's about how it converts calories into 
tools and how we use that to power what we do um, and how efficient our body is at different activities. So it's kind of an interesting chapter if that's like your shtick, if you think that kind of stuff is cool. But um, it's not really on the AP exam, so we're not going to get too much into it. Um, the next thing we need to talk about is the idea between temperature, thermal energy, and heat. So I think sometimes we use some of these words interchangeably, like temperature and heat. Uh, we might say might mean the same thing, but they're all really different. And uh, we need to make sure that we can use these words appropriately whenever we talk about them in a uh, physics context. So let's look at the idea of thermal energy first. And you probably talked about this in chemistry, but this idea that um, gases are constantly moving, right? They're made up of little tiny atoms that are always in motion. And whenever we talk about thermal energy, what we're talking about is the total kinetic energy of those moving atoms. So here's a little graphic to show you. Don't pay attention to the fire down here just yet. But um, these molecules that are in the gas are moving, hence the little gray movement symbol there. Um, and if you take this gas and you place it over this flame, then the atoms in the gas will move faster uh, because they will have more kinetic energy. So that equates to an increase in thermal energy. Now, a second byproduct of adding this flameage here is that the temperature will also increase. So the kinetic energy will get higher, which means the thermal energy will get higher, and then the temperature will also get higher. So let's talk about temperature real quick. What is temperature? Temperature is the measure of the average kinetic energy of the atoms that make up the gas. So this is where everyone says, well, wait, doesn't that kind of sound like the same thing as thermal energy? And it kind of does, but it is not the same. So let's take a look at, a, at an example to kind of illustrate the difference between um, thermal energy and temperature. So let's say you have um, two samples of liquid. Let's say you have a cup, and this cup has some nice steaming hot coffee in it. And then um, this is kind of, you know, a typical coffee cup. Let's say it's an eight-ounce coffee cup. And then you have a swimming pool. And this swimming pool is full of nice, relaxing water. That's my water graphic, by the way. It's also kind of tilted, unfortunately. All right, so um, let's say that this uh, nice, warm, hot cup of coffee is um, 100 degrees Celsius is boiling. So let's say it's like 70 degrees Celsius. And let's say that this swimming pool is warm-ish, ish, um, let's say it's 30 degrees Celsius. All right, so that's actually pretty warm, but that's okay. So let's look at the difference between the temperature in these things and the thermal energy. Okay, so my question to you is which one of these objects, which one of these liquids has the higher temperature and which one of them has the higher thermal energy? In this case, the cup of coffee has the higher temperature, right? The temperature is 70 degrees Celsius. That means that on average, the molecules that are in this cup of coffee are moving much faster than the molecules that are in the swimming pool. But if we talk about thermal energy, the swimming pool has more thermal energy why? Because the swimming pool has more water molecules. So remember that temperature is the average. Thermal energy is the total. So if I have more molecules in my uh, gas or in my fluid, then that thing will have more thermal energy. All right, so let's look. Let's keep going. All right, so we use a thermometer to measure temperature, and thermometers use the idea, if you guys don't know how thermometers work, hopefully you do, but maybe not, um, 
the hotter something gets, the faster the molecules move. So the more space that the thing tends to take up, things tend to expand when they get warm. And so thermometers use this idea of expanding liquid uh, as the temperature heats up in the room or in a cup of hot water or whatever, the um, uh, liquid will expand up the tube. And we have three different scales for measuring temperature, Celsius, Fahrenheit, and Kelvin. We'll be dealing with Kelvin and Celsius quite a bit. So here are the conversions, if you guys don't remember them, from chemistry. Um, they're pretty straightforward. We might do one or two to practice, but I don't really think these are on your AP test uh, in the state, in the sense of converting temperatures. But it's helpful to know how to go back and forth. So a temperature of zero Kelvin is called absolute zero. I think we talked about that a little bit when we did this, when we discussed superconductors, but um, no temperature below this is zero. That's not really what I meant to write there. That should say that no temperature below this is possible. Um, Sorry, that shouldn't be zero, that should be possible. At this temperature, all kinetic energy is zero. So absolute zero in and of itself is kind of like a theoretical thing. Um, we've never, we've gotten pretty close to reaching absolute zero in a lab situation. We've gotten down to like five times 10 to the negative 10th Kelvin, which is pretty dang tiny and it's practically absolute zero, but we've never actually hit it. So let's talk about heat, the last thing we need to discuss. Um, heat is, something that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. We tend to make it synonymous with the word hot, but that's not really what it means. Uh, we say stuff like, oh, the heat today is so oppressive, but that's not really what we mean to say. We mean to say that the temperature is probably a little bit oppressive as well. All right, so let's look into what heat is. It's important to denote that heat is a process. Um, it denotes a transfer of energy either into or out of a system. So here we have a beaker of water and then we add uh, thermal energy to it, which, which requires a heat transfer, energy from the fire into the water, um, and then that will increase the temperature of the uh, water and the thermal energy. So heat is transferred between two objects uh, whenever there's a temperature difference between them. Heat always flows from hot to cold. So how does this happen on the atomic scale? So let's look at a graphic that we can uh, illustrate this with. So let's say we have a container and this container contains two different gases and there's a little uh, membrane between the two of them. Uh, let's say this is like T1 and this is T2. And let's say that T1 is much hotter than T2. So this stuff, the gases that are on this side are much, they have a higher temperature. And then these guys over here, not as much temperature. So these guys will be moving pretty fast. Pshoo, pshoo. And these guys will be moving kind of slow. Well, let's say this membrane is so thin that the molecules can't transfer between the two sections, but they can still collide with one another between the membranes. So a super fast molecule will come and hit and meet with a super slow molecule. So this creates an elastic collision. After this collision, they bounce apart. Well, this one was going much faster before, so as it rebounds, it will lose a little bit of velocity, it will lose a little bit of energy. This one was going much slower when they collided, so now it will rebound with a much faster velocity um, and a greater energy. So this one will lose energy, this one will gain energy. And as these collisions continue to happen between these two molecules, eventually what will occur is that the system will reach thermal equilibrium. And thermal equilibrium happens when there is no more heat transfer uh, between the two sides of the gas. So in that state, we reach thermal equilibrium. So in that state, they have the same average kinetic energy. So because heat is a transfer of energy, which means that it could leave or enter a system, we need to be very, very careful about the signs that we use for heat transfer. If an object or a system is gaining energy, then we say that the heat, or we use a capital Q for heat, uh, heat is positive when energy is transferred into the system. 
Q is negative whenever energy is transferred out of the system. And just because of our whole energy conservation idea, it's important to note that the energy or the heat that one loses, because it's going to lose energy, so its energy is negative, will be the heat that two will gain. And those will be equal and opposite. All right, guys. I will see you all on Monday.